You know, we're really excited to have our guest in today, John McEwen. Um, I, and I want to start off by saying a little something. I, I try to not do a lot of praise at the very beginning <laughs> of the interview because, uh, you know, we want to make sure that everybody understands that musicians are human beings. But you're such a human being that I, I feel like... you so much. <laughs> I feel like I can I can actually do this. Uh, you know, there are a lot of groups that you know get bandied about when you talk about the introduction of country into rock and roll. When you talk about the introduction of bluegrass instrumentation into rock and roll, it's pretty easy to put your finger right on the nitty gritty dirt band. I think so. And, and Michael Murphy. And if you look at the nitty gritty dirt band, it's pretty easy to put your finger on John McEwen. Um, if you think about, <laughs> if you think about the bands that the most well-known person in the band is not up front singing. I've heard that before. <laughs> about the only one that I can come up with is My Santana. My mother said that. <laughs> yeah, about the only one that I can come up with is Santana. Um, and so John McEwen has a unique position in American music. And when you hear a banjo, uh, and there are a lot of banjos in popular music right now, uh, you can certainly uh, thank John McEwen for that influence. Thanks for coming in and spending your time with us today. Well, thank you. It's quite an honor to be here at well, the station that was next door to where the Dirt Band recorded a live album. Yes. The station had so much radio frequency, it made the tape machines go, <laughs> so we figured out how to get it out. Anyway. Well, that's why we brought you in, was to apologize for the buzz. About time. It yeah. was 40 years ago. <laughs> uh, and we'll get around to the Cowtown Ballroom and all that. I did want to mention that, of course, John is in town uh, to play in the Folly Bridge Americana Concert Series Friday night. And uh, actually in town early because he's got a full slate of things. Uh, tomorrow you're going to be over at the Steamboat Arabia about 5 o'clock uh, to sign copies of your book, The Life I've Picked. Yeah. Which is a great read. Um, so, Well, thank you. Uh, what a you know, when I finished the final manuscript and I had, I had to read it before it went to print, I couldn't put it down. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think we're already getting a sense for who uh, John is, but the story from the book that, that I thought really sort of defined you was oh. uh, when you were in school and uh, one of your teachers told you that, you know, a check is just a piece of paper and that you could cash anything. And so you made a bet with him and you went and cashed a check that was written on a watermelon. Yeah, <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> so what what kind of reaction did you get at the bank? Well... I said, I want to cash this check. And they said, what's that? I said, here it is. I rolled it over, and, and they cashed it. And somebody took a picture, and I ended up in the local paper. Boy, cash his check with a watermelon. You know? And I went, I like being in the paper. I, it moved my nerd stature, stature, status down a, a notch. <laughs> well, you always had this sense of performance. You wanted to be at the center of something. And, uh, and so one, one of the early things that you did was you uh, did magic and sold magic tricks at Disneyland. I made them too for a, a, a magician named Aldini. Wow. He called himself the Clever Heeb. I'm quoting, okay? Yeah. Yeah. There he was. He was dang, dang clever. He was a, a Jewish guy that was my boss at the magic shop, the first outside of working for my dad job that I had. So there were actually two, now correct me if I'm wrong, but there are two magic shops at Disneyland? There's a Main Street one and the one in Fantasyland, which is gone now. So you worked at one. I worked at both of them. Well, it, you, but you had a friend that worked at the other one. Steve Martin and I were trying to get a job at 16 years old working at the magic shop. He was selling guidebooks, and he'd, done, he'd been working Disneyland since he was 11, guidebooks and other things. And he was a stock boy at the Tiki Hut in Adventureland. But we were both trying to get a job at the magic shop because what a cool job. All you do is tricks all day. You're not working. And we got the job, and we celebrated by going and having lunch in Tomorrowland. You know, it, isn't it's, that weird? Tomorrowland, and we had no idea. We're 16 years old. You know, hey, this could really lead to something. <laughs> uh, we might get to Knott's Berry Farm. Well, he'd already worked there. All of a sudden, the arrow through the head trick makes so much more sense. <laughs> you know, uh, and you and Steve basically fell in love with the banjo almost in the exact same moment. I think it actually, my brother had a friend over that played about four songs on the banjo in my parents' house in the living room. 
And he knew Jed Clampett, old Joe Clark, Jesse James, and one other one. And we're standing there. It's like, man, that's the best thing I've ever heard. And the guy owned a music store. So Steve said to him, well, how much is a good, used, cheap banjo? (laughs) 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 An attitude that carried out through the rest of his life, being (laughs) cautious. Yeah. And yes, and then we started playing, and I was able to pick things up faster, and I'd show them to him. And he's always been kind enough to say I taught him how to play, but he has a natural ability, too. So you you got to see some kinds of music that you could relate to at the park. Occasionally, yeah. Because a guy that uh, wrote some songs later on, like Darcy Farrow and Back on the Street Again, Tom Campbell, who is now running the Guacamole Fund, the, the yes. organization that does Jackson Brown and Bonnie Raitt benefits, he was booking talent in Disneyland. They gave him the worst night of the week to do the Hootenanny, Monday. And it became the second best night of the week. And he was booking Claire Award singers and uh, all kinds of uh, bluegrass groups, Hoyt Axton, different types of people. Seeing the Dillards made you get really serious quick. You know, you ever know anybody who sits in somewhere and your leg is doing that, jumping up and down, kind of vibrating? And I never, I hated that. I, I sat next to a guy in school who wouldn't stop doing that, you know? And I, I changed chairs in that class. I went to see a group I'd never heard of called the Dillards. I didn't know what a Dillard was. And both of my legs started doing that. They hadn't gone on yet. I didn't know what they were. And then my hands started sweating. And then the announcer said, please make welcome from Salem, Missouri, the Dillards. And Doug and Rodney came out on that. I mean, I could, it's like it was a week ago. And that just took me. They were the perfect combination of the Smothers Brothers and Flatten and Scruggs. And funny. Oh, man, were they good. Tight. The music was hot. And Rodney became a lifelong friend. And we commun- In fact, he's coming to the Folly Theater. I told him I was playing here. He goes, hey, I'll come up and play. You want me to? I said, why are you asking? <laughs> <laughs> so Rodney Dillard, who was an American icon in music of acoustic Americana bluegrass, Americana bluegrassy, uh, they did their own music. They were from Salem, Missouri. They made a real impact that reached thousands of people as the Darlin family on the Andy Griffith Show. The Darwin Boys. And then on other things that they did around the country, albums they made, there would not be a Circle Be Unbroken album if it hadn't been for the Dillards. So when you saw them, you started practicing about eight hours a day. Uh, and you became well known for that instrument, but you didn't stop there. You, you have played all kinds of different instruments, everything from mandolin, I play, fiddle, I play guitar and banjo. And now it's like uh, you're, you're coming in here with a guitar that's shaped like a banjo. Just by coincidence. <laughs> uh, it's made in South Africa. It, it's the best sounding stage guitar I think I've ever had. Made by a guy that uh, <clears throat> makes a bunch of different types of instruments with this same kind of look called the Smooth Talker. <laughs> and uh, they're really neat. And yeah, I, I played mainly banjo. And I was playing with Jose Feliciano, used to hang out. B- in Southern California, when he first moved there, we go play coffee houses, and and this is before he was Jose Feliciano. Right, and this is, people go in. Hey, can my friend and I play a few tunes? Yeah, what's the deal with the dog? Well, he's blind. Oh, okay, people didn't know then that, that we, blind people didn't go out. As, Jose used to like to go ride bicycles, and he'd follow my bike. Wow. I stopped it when he said, I want to drive your car. <laughs> <laughs> he called me up one, a- one afternoon and said, can you take me to Irvine College? I got a gig up there. And, uh, yeah, sure, hadn't heard from you in a few months, probably four or five. And I thought he was going to play a little coffee house. I didn't know that Light My Fire had been all over the radio for some reason. And we got there, and there were 1,500 people in this room. And I went out and played four or five songs with them, and that was fun. And that was the night he said, John? You ought, to, you ought to just play a little more than the banjo. The banjo's good. I'm not saying it's bad, but, you know, you, the banjo only goes so far. Pick up something else, like a mandolin. So I did. Well, we'd love to hear you play something, if you wouldn't mind. Um, we'll come on by the show tomorrow, <laughs> on Friday. I've done a lot of these. That's the first time that, that, one, that anybody's ever played that card. <laughs> well, one of the guys that I really admire in playing is the Dirt Band's Nitty Gritty Dirt Band's first important job was playing a place called the Ash Grove. 
And it was like the village vanguard was in Kansas City. It was the place that people looking for free food and a, and a job would go play. Sometimes you only got the food. And we opened for Merle Travis. Merle Travis played the guitar like this. And then he played top notes. And he wrote a lot of songs, like 16 Tons, Dark as a Dungeon, and uh, a whole bunch of songs. And here's a song of his that I really like. I'll run through this. Ready, boys? <laughs> And a stranger traveling through this wearsome land. I've got a home in that yonder city, good Lord, and it's not not made by man. Well, I've got a father and a sister who have gone to that sweet home. I just pray that I can go in. See them, good Lord, over on on that other shore. Get it, boys. <laughs> yeah. Now, and when I'm dead, laying in my coffin, all of my friends. Both of my friends all gathered round. They will say that he, he's laying there sleeping. Good Lord. <laughs> Quit laughing, John. <laughs> this is serious. Yeah, because I am a pilgrim. And a stranger traveling through this wearsome land. You know, this is not a wearsome land. And when Mr. Travis wrote this, well, you see, in, in the 70s, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band was the first American group to go to Russia. It was like a whole other country over there. And uh, that was a worrisome land. They, uh, you know, it was a, a three-year jail sentence for possession of foreign currency. And a little stiff. Anytime you met somebody you didn't like, you just give them a couple bucks and say goodbye. But it was a... It was a life-changing event. We did 28 sold-out shows. <laughs> and it was a worrisome land. <laughs> yeah, I'm a pilgrim and a stranger Traveling through that wearsome land. Get it, boys. Boy, you sound like a lot of people, John. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, they like you, too. That's the other part of it. Uh, so, you know, we're speaking with John, uh, John McEwen, who is playing Friday night at the Folly Theater, part of the Folly Bridge Americana Concert Series. So you had the guitar. You'd been playing it a lot. You wanted a nicer guitar. So as a young man, and I'm thinking that you were probably just out of high school, maybe, you became a concert promoter. And you booked... I wasn't a concert promoter. I was a guy that could raise a couple thousand dollars. Yeah. Uh, the, the guy that I raised it for was the promoter. But yes, I thought, this sounds like fun. You, you had Bob Dylan play a high school. We got Bob Dylan for $4,000 to play Wilson High School in Long Beach. And uh, I had to go borrow money from my dad for somebody he'd never heard of. And... Uh, Really, Dad, it's, it's going to work, and I'll pay you back in nine weeks. And I paid him back in eight weeks. And uh, I made enough money to buy a banjo, a new banjo, which is the one I really wanted. And uh, Does Bob know he bought you a banjo? No. 
I, I've met him a couple times, but you know, he's in a different world. He's in yeah. Bob's world, <laughs> which is fine because yeah. everybody wants to have something to say to some. When you, I kind of grew up in this business, and there's some people you can talk to, and some people that I don't know. They listen to their managers, record company, press agent reviews, or whatever, and the, uh, whatever you know. I mean, uh, Dolly Parton, not like that at all. Dolly is Dolly. I've done about 40 shows with her. John McEwen, I'm going to start my own makeup line because it costs a lot of money to look this cheap. What do you think? <laughs> you know, and I want to open an amusement park and call it Dollywood. That sounds cute, <laughs> don't it? You know, and she did. Yeah. And, and she goes there. Yeah. She's really in tune, you know? So, you know, the we talked about getting a hold of instruments and how much they cost and what do you have to do to get them. Uh, the shop that everybody seemed to gravitate to is McCabe's. The, yeah. And actually, people hanging out at McCabe's was kind of the, the where the nitty-gritty dirt band formed out of. The McCabe's guitar shop in Long Beach was an extension of the mothership in Santa Monica. And the one in Santa Monica is still going strong. And it, it is really a wonderful place full of instruments, and it's full of 1965, you know? Yeah. I mean, you go in there, and you, you expect to smell patchouli oil. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Where am I, you know? And I wasn't into the hippie thing. I looked like one, but, you know, I mean, I, I ran into a guy. Here's, this guy was a perfect example. I'm walking down Sunset around 1969. Hey, John, hey, how you doing? Haven't seen you in a long time. I was wondering, you know, I was thinking about you. Are you a Pisces? No, I'm not. Oh, uh, oh you're a Virgo, aren't you? No, I'm not. Uh, are you a Gemini? No, I'm not a Gemini. Uh, are you a Sagittarius? Yes, I'm Sagittarius. Oh, I knew it. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah. You know, the, the, um, so you formed the dirt band and the dirt band's always been sort of an on again, off again. And, and, uh, I'm sorry, repeat. The dirt band has been a little bit of an off on again, off again. I gotta say not too much. So Jimmy and Jeff were two of the guys and they had this I seminal idea and Les Thompson called me, we'd had a bluegrass group called the Wil Wilmore City Moonshiners that must have played at least five pizza parlors. And uh, we did a couple dozen, they weren't shows, they were working for free food and $15, you know. That lasted and then it broke up. I went and played with Michael Murphy for six months. Then Les called me and said, hey, the guys at the music store, Jeff and Jimmy, are, we're getting together and playing music, wanna join us? I went, yeah, I'll give it a shot. I taught him one of my songs, a banjo song, because I needed somebody to back me up in a banjo contest, <laughs> and I won. So I figured, okay, I'll stay with these guys. Yeah, I won, and uh, never entered another contest. So that was the first Nitty Gritty Dirt Band in my mind. Right. And that was the one that made the first record, the first album, Buy From Me The Rain. And Les Thompson is with me at the Folly Theater. It is so much fun, the show we've been doing, because I've got John Cable, who went to Russia with us, Les Thompson, who was an original member that used to wear the Mountie suit. Some people might remember. A guy. Wasn't there a guy in a Mountie suit? Yeah, it was Les. I thought that was a cool idea. It won't fit him now, though. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Matt Cartsonis, who used to play with Warren Zevon a lot and Austin Lounge Lizards. Matt, we don't turn him loose till the uh, middle of the set because he's too hard to follow. So you, uh, you, one of your early breaks was you all got signed up to be in Paint Your Wagon, of all things. Now, that, that was an example of good manager. My brother was managing us at the time, and we're sitting around his office on Sunset Boulevard, 8833 Sunset, if you've ever been there, the building with the two glass elevators, and he's reading Daily Variety. He goes, this is it. I said, what's it? This is going to work. And audition, auditions are being held for the role of miners for an 1848 setting and movie Paint Your Wagon. A week later, we went through those Paramount gates that I used to sit outside eating lunch going, someday I might get through those gates delivering a pizza or something. But I just wanted to get in that Paramount lot, the one on, gates on Melrose. The big, you'd see Elvis come out of there and all the actors, everybody came and went, someday. 
And there we were going through the gates, parking, got a drive on, and parking inside to go audition for Joshua Logan and Alan Lerner. And Alan J. Lerner, you know, an American in Paris, Camelot, all, it, it, <laughs> you really felt this big. Yeah. You know, playing jug band music for these guys. Okay. Uh, or Lerner was sitting there scratching his arms all the whole time like this. Uh, talking to Joshua Logan, one of Broadway's biggest directors. Okay, do another song. We do another song. <laughs> and anyway, he goes, okay, we can use you after about 40 minutes. Wow. And I was like, we're in a Paramount movie. Yeah. What a shock. With Clint Eastwood, Lee Marvin. Learning how to sing. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> you know, uh, then, of course, along comes Mr. Bojangles. Huge hit for you all. Now, what about it? It was a huge hit. Sort of yeah. changed the trajectory of the band. And uh, that's, it's one of the things that led to the Circle album. Just like the Dillards influenced me to play the banjo, which made me get to know Earl Scruggs. If I hadn't played the banjo, there wouldn't have been a Circle album. But as my belief that that line is not just mine. It goes through everybody. Jeff and Jimmy picked a lot of great songs that got the Uncle Charlie album on the radio. We were rehearsing in Les's dad's jukebox factory in Long Beach for the fifth album, Uncle Charlie and his dog Teddy. And Jeff came in one day and said, I heard a song on the radio about a dancer in jail with a dead dog. I said, that sounds pretty grim. <laughs> you know, and Jimmy Ibbotson said, I've got that in, my, in the trunk of my car. And he had a 45 of Mr. Bojangles by Jerry Jeff Walker. And, and some girl had given it to him before he left Philadelphia. So he, he left Philadelphia to drive his Dodge Dart all the way to L.A., and he made it in a Dodge Dart. And <laughs> that record was the only record in the trunk of his car. And we learned it. We thought it would be a good album cut. The record company said it was going to be a single. And for more of the story, tune in the Folly Theater. <laughs> we love to go into that story and play that version more than the, the radio. You've heard the radio version. I like to give the background version. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it's more instrumental involved and stuff. So you actually have spent a whole bunch of time uh, around Kansas City and, and environs. And we are literally about a block and a half, two blocks from the Cowtown Ballroom, which is one of your all-time favorite places. We played there more than any group. We we're the first and the last. And, and Steve Martin. That 1,700 capacity place usually had 2,200 people in it. It was so crowded they couldn't laugh he he uh, they couldn't laugh ho 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 they had to laugh he 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 <laughs> Thank you WC Fields uh, Steve Martin even opened some of those shows too Yeah, yeah. that was really fun When you were there for the last show uh, I'm assuming it was a, a bit melancholy Yeah because it was the first time it felt like an arrow was either changing or passing or why does this have to go away Well I don't know. You know, everything was, uh, it was all fine. But whatever the reasons were, Stan Plessridge couldn't keep it going or whatever. And uh, then, yeah, things passed. You was, also played the Ozark Music Festival. That was a riot. It, literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you talk about it in the book, and you talk about the number of people. We got uh, uh, so you, uh, people listening on the radio Listen really close. Let me see a show of hands for how many people know about the Sedalia Ozark Festival. I'm just curious. Cool. <laughs> well, for those listening, about 800 hands went up. And yeah. Uh, yeah, that was weird. You know, you talked about it in terms of playing to an ocean of people. But, you know, the thing that we talk about the most is um, how devastating I mean, you know in retrospect it's horrifying it's funny it's a little bit of everything um i guess that you know i mean the fences came down there were reports from farmers that people had killed his pigs and cows and, and they're eating one of my cows the field, <laughs> you know because there wasn't food to eat after it was over, the state decided that they weren't sure what the hippies had left behind, so they sent in bulldozers 
and they took the topsoil off the fairgrounds and they dropped lime from helicopters because of Ooh. what the hippies might have left behind. Um, so like how much of the chaos of that did you guys experience? It was the heat that was experienced more than anything. It was 118 on stage. My steel guitar, that I, the little lap steel that I play, it was so hot that when I put it on my lap, I went, yike, I had to put a, a towel under it. Then I picked up the metal bar and I couldn't hold it. <laughs> Wow. So I took a glass of water and just poured it on the whole thing. I didn't care if it quit working. At least it wouldn't be hot. And But it was 100 and, about 115 on stage, and you're playing to a field of basketballs. That's It was just heads. 183,000 people on that racetrack. And they were, all, they were all nice. There was no pandemonium, really, uh, that we saw. And uh, the good news was the Hells Angels took over the security. <laughs> the Nobody's bad news was the Hells Angels took <laughs> over the security. They were okay. <laughs> they were fine. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but it was just, uh, yeah, it was a could have gone really bad. It could yeah. have gone Altamont, but it didn't. Yeah. And it was, you had Earl Scruggs Review and Charlie Daniels Band, and uh, you know the lineup better than I. Um, it was different, that's for sure. Yeah. So you you covered Earl, uh, and and one of his sons took him that record, and he ended up coming. One of his sons, what? One of his sons uh, played that record for for him. Oh, the Uncle Charlie album. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, he ended up coming to see you. Yeah. <laughs> what a shock. Yeah. Yeah. And that that eventually helped lead to Will a Circle Be Unbroken. Well, he came to one of his songs was Randy Lynn Rag a real fast banjo tune, and I put it on the Uncle Charlie album. And he came up to me when I first met him. I just wanted to meet the boy who played Randy Lynn Rag the way I intended to. And I didn't really, couldn't go to sleep that night. Oh, my gosh. The, this guy who I'd been, let's put it this way. My mom used to say, you're better than that Earl Scruggs guy. I said, Mom, everything I play, he wrote. <laughs> you know? And I'm not. And there's only one. And uh, anyway, so that opened up the friendship. And uh, another thing I was proud of to this day is Ralph Stanley, who was a big bluegrass iconic, the O-Death singer guy and banjo player. He came up to me at a festival around 75 and says, Hey, John McEwen, how's that five string doing? And I said, Ralph, you know my name. I'm shocked. I mean, he didn't have to know anybody's name. He was Ralph Stanley. Yeah. And I was deep into his music, Carter and Ralph. I said, why is it? Uh, well, let me tell you something. You put that Clinch Mountain Backstep, one of his songs, on that Uncle Charlie album, that was the biggest royalty check I'd ever seen. <laughs> So of course he's going to know your name. Good way to get to know somebody. Yeah. <laughs> We'd love to hear another song if we could. Pardon? Another? Another song, if we could? Well, one of the things I tried to do over the years with the Dirt Band and with my own music is play the guitar and put it in a tuning that's kind of like a banjo. Let me get it there. So when you strum it, it's an open chord. And you can do things like, you can do that really easy. Of course, it's easy anyway, but, and, uh, and when you play it, you can play somewhere between Travis style and banjo notes like this. This was uh, when Jimmy Ibbotson and I worked up Long Hard Road. It opened with the guitar and detuning like this on the Dirt Band record. And he starts singing, you know, way back in my memory, there's a scene that I recall. I'm not going to try to sing it. It just gives a whole full sound. It's like a lot going on. Then the other people come in. Well, I, th I think of it as this way, too. I'm playing the guitar, and some jerk starts singing, you know. <laughs> Quiet, I'm playing. And no, it's fine. And that leads to, it led to uh, coming up with songs in the tuning. Like this one, uh, let's see. Okay, I don't know what the name of it is. Let's see. 
John McEwen is our guest. He's playing Friday night at the Folly, part of the Folly Bridge Americana Concert Series. He's got a new book, The Life I've Picked. He also has lots of great CDs, including Made in Brooklyn and a whole series of uh, CDs with string wizards in the title that are also really great and worth checking out. Um, you know, will the circle be unbroken? I don't um, think so. Oh, what? Will, <laughs> will the circle be unbroken is such a... Uh, it's like a seminal document in American music. Um, it's the uh, dark side of the moon of bluegrass. It, really, it's always on an Amazon chart or somewhere, and people always reference it. It's really a, quite a. It's in the Library of Congress and the Grammy Hall of Fame. You know, I'm sure that you are going to uh, be talking about that at the Folly on on Friday night. But I, I wondered if you could just talk about taking Maybell Carter a gold record. Well, that was really fun. One of the purposes to me of putting Circle album together was to pay homage to these people that have basically gave me a life in music. Merle Travis, uh, Earl Scruggs, Maybell Carter. In 65, I was listening to an album called Songs of the Famous Carter Family by Flatt and Scruggs. I, I listened to that every night for a year, it seems like. And it was just magic music. And my life has been so lucky that, let me just skip over about 45 years. A couple years ago, my wife and I were trying to think of something to do. I was on the road, and I couldn't get home for two days and then fly it out. It just, you get there, you're tired. The next day, you got to get ready to leave. You know, I said, why don't you meet me somewhere? And I'm talking to John Carter Cash, the son of Johnny and June, because I've been working with him. And he says, well, why don't you stay at Maybell's house? I said, what? Well, Maybell's house up in Hilton, Virginia. I said, you mean the house that they drove to Bristol, Tennessee in 1927 to start country music recording from Ralph Peer? Yeah, that one. So, <laughs> how lucky is that? It wasn't like an Airbnb. It was Maybell Carter's house that she'd lived in in 1927. And it looked, they had it all fixed up so it looked like it was about 1937. You know? Yeah. And... Uh, so we spent a few days there. So and you, I don't know what your question was. You just made no, me think no, of it. It's, I, I, but you lead to my next question beautifully. You not only stayed in that house, but you have also stayed in Johnny and Jin's New York City apartment. Oh, come on. That's embarrassing. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, Marty Stewart, I'd hire him for, you know, Marty Stewart, I'd hire him back in the day for $50 a night to go out and back me up when I go do duo shows. Well, they were duo because of him, because I, I just like to play. I, it's what I always wanted to do. It's the life I picked. Right. Uh, <laughs> and one night I said, Marty, I, I mean, one time before we're going out, I can pay you 100 a night if you can get the cash apartment in Central Park. Because right on the south end of Central Park, they had an apartment that they'd stay in every now and then. And he did. He asked him, and... Cash said, well, you boys have a good time up there, okay? Be good now. And I think I did what everybody here would have done. Yeah. Where I, w I flipped the coin to see who got the bedroom. Marty didn't know that I knew how to flip a coin. Thank you, Magic Shop Days. 
I got the bedroom. You'd use that if you had it in your arsenal. And you're standing in Johnny Cash and June Carter's bedroom. Wouldn't you look in the closet? <laughs> you had to look in the closet. It's a privileged spot. And sure enough, there were two men in black outfits in dry cleaners, plastic, all ready to go. And next to him was a pink chiffon nightgown, really, really long. She was tall, little furry thing around the neck, you know. And you weren't going to fit it, into Johnny's suits. Uh, Johnny's suits was good. And that Jim Carter nightgown, it fit like a glove. Uh, <laughs> and it really was, I felt pretty good in it. And, <laughs> And I went out and sneaked up behind Marty. He's laying on the floor watching TV. And I put my leg over him and says, hey, big boy, let's have some fun. <laughs> now, Marty Stewart does not move fast. <laughs> but that night, he jumped up like a, like a grasshopper and ran right into the wall. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have always been the guy that was looking for the next thing, looking for the next adventure, looking for the next opportunity to grow, which has led you into some really unusual things. Um, legendary session drummer Jim Gordon and you played in Andy Williams' band. The Dirt Band, after Paint Your Wagon, broke up, and uh, Jeff didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't want to be in a band without him, so I'm done too. So Bernie Ledden and I played together for a few months. Then he went on to start getting Burrito Brothers and then go start the Eagles. But he turned down, a, he had been asked to do a job, and he says, hey, go try out for this because I can't make it. I'm getting in this burrito brand. And I auditioned for Andy Williams at his office on La Cienega. And uh, he puts on a record. He goes, uh, play the banjo along with this. And it was for once in my life, <laughs> you know. And fortunately, it was like, for once in my life. Boy, went wrong key. For once in my life. Yeah. You know, they're playing the band. This is like a banjo, like I said earlier. It was easy to. For once in my life, I found someone who needs me. You know, this one. All picking stuff. And I got about that far, and I'm going, I'm going to get kicked out of here. And he said, you got the job. And the drummer's Jimmy Gordon. Be so, in Vegas in a week. Uh, Jim Gordon played on so many records. Huge session drummer. At, also played the piano part in Layla. Yeah, at that point in time, he'd played on about a third of the records in the Hot 100. We'd drive down, some, we'd drive down Vegas Strip with the radio on. I can dig it, you can dig it, we can dig it. That's me. You know, these boots are made for walking. That's me. You know, it didn't... It, it, every third song he was on. So he... Uh, he tragically uh, turned out to be completely insane. He murdered his mother and is still Tragic for his mom more than him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, He's so, in the same jail as Phil Spector. And, uh, and, uh, did, you see, did you see any sign? Was he? None. Yeah. Other than when he got into heroin and he was a little aberrant, you might say. But I didn't see a lot of that. But when, when, the, when the drugs came along for almost anyone, things got ruined. Yeah. You know, I say almost anyone because some people will get ruined and they'll get out of it. Toy Caldwell didn't get out of it. He's always trying to get me to do cocaine. I turned him down. I'm really glad. You know that there you've you've been making music for well over 50 years, and you you've been important to music. And you're going to sue me for malpractice? No. Oh. Okay. Uh, and you know you. Um, You've developed a fan base, and so that fan base leads you into things, too. You actually played at Mickey Mouse's funeral. Oh, that was fun. I, put, <laughs> I said I put the fun back in funeral. Yeah, yeah. So just to set it up, the, the guy who did the voice well, of Mickey I, Mouse. I got a call in New York when I was living there from a lady with a really high voice and says, my husband just died. He was your biggest fan. And I wondered if you'd play at his funeral. He'd really appreciate it. I said, well, what does your husband do? Well, for 35 years, he's been the voice of Mickey Mouse. Hmm, really? Oh. Uh, what do you do, ma'am? She goes, I'm the voice of Minnie. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> who, uh, who had you call me? Merle? Who's, uh, what's going on here? Well, she had to audition for the role of Minnie 30 years earlier, and Wayne Allwine approved her. And a year later, they got married. 
And Disney wouldn't let them say they were married because they didn't want them to get divorced because they knew the papers, Mickey and Minnie get divorced, <laughs> you know. So they couldn't say they were married for like two years. It was quiet, you know. So there I was at Forest Lawn doing about a 20, 30-minute set to about 100 people. Well, they weren't just people. It was Pluto and Goofy and the Fairy Godmother. All the other voice actors. All the other voice uh, Kermit and Gonzo were there, and that was really cool. And uh, and then she hands me the, uh, well, here's Wayne's guitar. It's time for the song. And I'm going, yeah, I'm standing next to Wayne's coffin, Mickey's coffin. They called him Mickey. They called him Wayne. He answered to both. I'm standing next to the coffin, and I have to play. You know? And everybody's singing. Now, see, this is where it really got weird, okay? <laughs> because it wasn't just some guy like you that said Donald Duck. It was Donald Duck. <laughs> and I didn't think it would get weirder. But... <laughs> Next to the coffin, she walks up pipe by the coffin, and it goes. Now it's time to say goodbye. To she looks at it. Him, I see, and she goes, "See you real soon." <laughs> and everybody said, "Why?" Because we love you. So that that's one it. of those moments where you're crying and laughing at the same time. Yeah, it was. It was. Rusi doesn't mind me telling that story because she just loves, she's a very up person. She does, a, she does a four or five different voices and she's become a good friend since then. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, I was texting her just a week ago. She was sick or something. But yeah, what a weird thing. I worked in Disneyland. I love the Disney thing. And my daughter is a Disney freak. She works. She's worked for Disney for 25 years. Wow. Blames me. And, uh, <laughs> but she's really good at it. And uh, one of her daughters is going to go to the Disney University. I used to go outside the magic shop every day at 5 when the band had come by to take down the flag and, and watch that. It was really a good thing. You and, know, uh, um, anyway, so you've had an amazing life, multiple Grammy winner, um, produced albums, played on albums, your solo career, your work with the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Uh, I think all of that is going to come to bear Friday night at the Folly well, Theater. With two previous Dirt Band members that love being on stage and doing things that put us all on the edge, we throw out, we usually every night do at least one song we haven't played together before. Wow. But, you know, I'll say, you know, such and such, don't you? You know, you know, okay. It's going to be there, you know. And we do Carter Family Music. We do a lot of music from the Circle Be Unbroken album because the show has all the pictures from the album and dialogue and conversation between Doc and Maybell and us and Roy Acuff with the pictures cut behind it and things like Doc will say, Maybell, you remember how you started, uh, the ending you put on that old thing? And she says, well, on the old record, I started it like this. And then we play it on stage. You know, the yeah. song, as the pictures go by, it's really fun. Yeah. Well, we can't wait for it. It's Friday night. Uh, that series is all about authenticity, and you embody that. Again, the name of the book is The Life I've Picked, and there are multiple CDs out there, including uh, the Made in Brooklyn CD and a series of String Wizard CDs, and uh, I'm sure that there's a whole merch table full of goodness waiting for I you Friday night at up. the Folly. And again, uh, there's also going to be the signing tomorrow at 5 over at the Steamboat Arabia. It'll be kind of like this, except you guys will be able to talk more. <laughs> John McEwen, thanks so much for joining us today Thank on The you. Bridge. Like I said to my mom, thanks for having me. John McEwen. Aww.